Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, I'm Richard Ayler, the Division of Infectious Disease. So we're going to start out today by uh, talking about malaria. Now, consistently, our, um, our post-fellowship survey suggests that uh, arthropod-associated infections are an important area to reinforce your knowledge uh, for testing. And that's why, particularly at the north end, we try to place an emphasis on those types of infections. And when you think about the great scourges of mankind that involve arthropods, there's perhaps no more uh, weighty and predominant uh, type of infection than malaria. I mean, uh, each year malaria kills between 1 and 2.7 million people. Um, it, it's a disease that has persisted in uh, much of the third world, especially in the tropical zones. There's some suggestion that those temperate regions may, may expand and may change with uh, uh, the impact on, on climate that we're seeing. And, um, uh, and there's much activity uh, in, the, in the development uh, of malaria therapies, particularly with regard to vaccines. So um, again, I've tried to update this presentation in the past year uh, to make it applicable to everyone. So when you look at the leading worldwide causes of death, uh, this is from 2002, the latest uh, for which uh, I was able to find statistics. Uh, malaria ranks uh, five out of the top 10 infectious diseases of uh, causes of death um, behind respiratory infections, HIV, and, and tuberculosis. So, um, so this is a, a major cause of death worldwide um, and, uh, and, and certainly one of, of significant importance. Historically, when you look back at literature, it's it's really fascinating to see how malaria has, uh, um, you know, has been mentioned in all kinds of different uh, um, works of, of of literature and art. And uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Dante, the author of the Divine Comedy, may be interested to know that uh, he mentioned uh, malaria very prominently in the Inferno. And you can see here, it says, as one who has the shivering of the quartan so near that he has his nails already pale and trembles all, still keeping the shade. Um, it's kind of interesting to see how perceptive he was about mentioning the periodicity of, of malaria, uh, probably uh, Plasmodium malariae in this case. Uh, the pallor of the nails with anemia and, and uh, uh, the shivering, sort of the tremors that are seen in these patients. And uh, Dante himself, for th those of you who are students of history, um, was uh, thought to have died of malaria in 1321. In fact, uh, he's not the only uh, historical figure that has been influenced or affected by this pathogen. Alexander the Great was said to uh, have succumbed to malaria. Genghis Khan in the 13th century. Uh, Christopher Columbus had to cut short uh, one of his uh, final trips to the New World as a result of coming down with malaria. Abraham Lincoln uh, suffered from malaria uh, on a couple of occasions uh, during his upbringing. And John F. Kennedy acquired the malaria in World War II. Malaria has had a strong relationship to war, in fact. Uh, it said in the American Civil War there were some 1.3 million episodes and 10,000 deaths. And uh, in World War I, in Macedonia, British, French, and German armies became immobilized for three years by malaria. In World War II, there was so much um, a mortality from malaria. Uh, 60,000 U.S. troops in Africa and the South uh, Pacific that General Douglas MacArthur said, this will be a long war if for every division I have facing the enemy, I must count on a second division in the hospital with malaria and a third division convalescing from this debilitating disease. And malaria played an important part in the Vietnam War, uh, where it was said to have felled more combatants during the war than bullets. But one advantage, one positive that came out of the Vietnam War from uh, regarding malaria is uh, in 1967, Chinese scientists set up a project looking at new therapies for, uh, for malaria to help the Vietnamese military um, by developing artemedicine, artemesinin rather, based anti-malarial 
formulations. This was the, uh, the beginning of the development of the artemisinins. And in the 2000s, malaria has been endemic in all the theaters of uh, the major theaters of combat uh, or of uh, where, where our troops have been stationed, including uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Malaria played a significant role in the development of the Panama Canal. In 1904, uh, the Isthmian Canal Commission was formed, uh, which included several great uh, uh, figures in infectious disease from the early 20th century, including uh, Colonel George Gorgas and John Ross. And they knew that uh, tropical and parasitic diseases would be a significant factor in the construction of the canal. And as a result, they formed a sanitary department and initiated a mosquito control program. As part of this, they, they did some uh, really tremendous um, infection control and uh, disease control um, initiatives, including draining pools, clipping uh, brush and grass, oiling the ponds, application of larvicides, and they, apply, they provided quinine to, the, to all the workers. Um, once their ears stopped ringing, they got back to work. No, seriously. Govern, government buildings were screened in and mosquitoes were removed from dwellings. So as a result, there was a 90% decline in the malaria rate from 1906 to 1909. And uh, it's felt that if not for this vector control for yellow fever and malaria, the Panama Canal simply could not have been built. So tremendous, uh, tremendous involvement. And one of the reasons why uh, we celebrate uh, Colonel uh, George Gorgas is one of the, the great pioneers of infection prevention. So um, this is a uh, representation of malaria or countries or, or areas of risk of transmission for uh, 2010, the latest where we have statistics. And you can see that, of course, malaria is a disease of the temperate zones of, of the, I should say, the tropical zones of the world. Uh, and not just uh, of the African continent, but of, of uh, South and Central America uh, and many parts of Asia and Oceania um, where uh, there is a risk of malaria or um, a, a lesser risk, but still a, a finite risk of acquiring malaria. And um, as more of you travel uh, during your uh, career, I think you'll confront this and, and the need whether or not uh, you yourselves need to be prophylaxed. Here's a little uh, 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 sort of closer in guide of, um, of malaria endemic countries, dividing the east and the west. <laughs> Who is this now? Chile. Chile. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think I think again. Uh, if my my impression is probably a lot of Chile is probably above the elevation for malaria, but. But we'll touch on more on that in a minute. But you can see within uh, areas related to the U.S. or close in proximity to the U.S., malaria uh, continues to be very active in Mexico and uh, in the Dominican Republic as well as Haiti. And occasionally in Florida we have cases of malaria too. So I can't eliminate the possibility that in, uh, during your fellowship you could come across a malaria case here. Um, and uh, again, you talk about the, uh, the, the tropical zones of Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Uh, China, is, um, China has some malaria, but only in certain restricted zones. Um, much of China is malaria-free. Now, most cases of falciparum occur really in uh, the African continent, but there's um, you know, th there, there's a possibility of falciparum occurring really all across the world. So it's not just a falciparum, of course, as we know, is the most uh, severe of the forms of malaria um, occur really all, all across the, um, the malaria endemic zones of the world. So uh, those of you know that um, there are now five species of malaria. The traditional species of malaria, of course, are, were Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, ovale, and Plasmodium malariae. But in recent years, we've recognized a fifth strain of malaria, Plasmo Plasmodium nolisi, which originally was felt to be a disease of, uh, of macaques in Asia, but in more recent years has been recognized to sporadically 
uh, cause infection in humans. Um, it's morphologically similar to Plasmodium malariae, but, uh, but somewhat more severe, and, uh, and there is a potential for, uh, for a fatality from Nolisi for if you're unlucky enough to be exposed. So not a great player in malaria um, in terms of, of uh, human exposure, but sporadic cases do occur. The epidemiology of malaria, uh, there are up to 2.7 mi million deaths annually. Uh, more th most malaria infection, greater than 90%, is due to falciparum or vivax. So about 50% falciparum, maybe 40% vivax, 10% the remaining um, uh, ovale or malariae, um, or occasionally nolisi. So if you remember these two strains causing more than 90% of malaria, uh, I think that will be helpful uh, in terms of evaluating patients. Most deaths, of course, are due to plasmodium falciparum. Now, the life cycle of the malaria parasite, um, it seems very complicated, but it's actually a bit more simple than perhaps this graph would suggest. So I'm going to switch over to uh, up-to-date infectious diseases, which I think has a better uh, life cycle. And the life cycle of the malaria parasite begins uh, when the mosquito takes a blood meal and uh, sporozoite, sporozoites from the, mid from the salivary glands, I should say, um, are injected into the circulation where they migrate to the liver and infect hepatocytes. Uh, when they infect hepatocytes, they can do one of two things. They can go into a dormant stage known as the hypnozoite stage, um, or they can become uh, a multinucleated schizonts within the liver. Now these schizonts ultimately rupture uh, once they, they, uh, they, they rupture into the circulation and they form what are known as mirozoites. These mirozoites invade RBCs and uh, they mature to, uh, to form trophozoites. The trophozoites are the ring forms that you typically see in the peripheral blood. And remember that these uh, uh, trophoz trophozoites um, have a stage of maturity, and, uh, and, so, and they also have a periodicity. So you may not see ring forms at time zero. You may see them at time one. And that's the reason why when you order uh, thin and thick smears of the blood, you want to make sure that you just don't order one set. You want to order them, if, if necessary, um, four to six times a day. Um, for 48 hours. So, so uh, you'll increase the likelihood you'll pick up the trophozoites in the circulation during the time when they're active. Now, the early trophozoites can do uh, one of two things. Um, most typically, they mature to form late trophozoites and then what are known as RBC schizonts. Um, those, uh, those schizonts will rupture within the circulation and repeat the cycle again. It's this rupturing and release of the mirozoites that uh, is associated with the periodic fever that you see in malaria. Now remember that malaria uh, of different strains um, have, uh, are associated with a different uh, periodicity. So um, typically Plasmodium malariae, uh, which is known as quartan fever, has a breakout of this cycle every 72 hours, whereas uh, whereas falciparum, um, vivax, and ovale tend to be every uh, 24 hours or so. They're called tertian malaria. Um, so if, if uh, the trophozoites don't um, mature to form schizonts, some of them form gametocytes, and the gametocytes end up being ingested by another mosquito. The gametocytes uh, migrate to the, uh, to the midgut, where they mature into sporozoites, and then those sporozoites migrate to the salivary glands, and the cycle repeats itself when the mosquito bites another host. So, um, any questions about that? No? So, not the mirozoites, not typically. They're too small. Where you really see um, morphology is with the trophozoite forms. Now, um, if you're a skilled pathologist who's familiar with malaria, 
you can pick out, you can identify a strain of malaria by the trophozoites and the other um, forms during the erythrocytic stage uh, because they, they are different. And uh, we'll see that in a minute. So these are some uh, pathology slides of, uh, of the cycle of malaria uh, replication in different forms. So here's a, a section of a mosquito showing the oocysts and uh, the sporozoites. Oocysts are here, actually, and the sporozoite is here. So again, this is within the mosquito. So remember, that's the phase uh, just prior to uh, um, the release of um, of the um, sporozoites uh, into the circulation. Here's a section of the liver showing an enlarged parenchymal cell full of merozoites. So this would be um, right before the release of merozoites into the circulation. Th this is the erythrocytic stage of Plasmodium malariae. And uh, so uh, these are the, this, here's the trophozoite um, progressing uh, early band form to band form. These are early and mature schizonts uh, and, uh, and a female and male gametocyte. So this is morphologically different than, let's say, Plasmodium falciparum. And uh, um, I, I recall on one or two occasions pulling out my pathology book with all the different forms and, and going down the lab and looking at a um, a blood smear to see if I could identify um, this particular strain and identifying it to be, in fact, uh, falciparum. So, you know, in the, in the era of uh, rapid diagnosis of infectious disease and PCR tests, it's important to remember that PCR tests are actually slower than the naked eye looking at uh, a, a microscope and identifying a pathogen. So the most rapid tests are the, sometimes the most basic. So you can see that uh, um, these, I, I can't tell you for, I know these are non-falciparum. They, be, uh, they may be malariae. Um, and here you can see the trophozoites for falciparum. And obviously, they're quite different, right? I mean, if you were looking at this under a microscope, you could tell that, that uh, these trophozoites were, were different than these. So again, species variability. Um, and here is a section of the brain showing blood vessels blocked uh, with developing P. falciparum gametocytes. Um, this is uh, obviously a patient who could be experiencing cere cerebral malaria, which obviously is a very potentially devastating complication of falciparum infection. So um, we know that uh, malaria is predominantly arthropod transmitted, but uh, what are some other ways you can get malaria? You can get malaria from a blood transfusion, right? Can you get malaria from transplant? You can get malaria from transplants. So predominantly, this is an arthropod transmitted infection, but rarely there are cases of, uh, of non-arthropod transmitted malaria. We remember that this is predominantly the female Anopheles mosquito, which is a, a nighttime biter. So if you're in, the, in uh, the tropics and you get bit by a mosquito during the day, you might come down with your dengue fever or your yellow fever. And then if you let your guard down, go to sleep and don't put on your, your mosquito net, then you'll come down with your malaria at night. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a good idea to be careful out there. Right, Luis? Yes. Um, so again, uh, transplant, uh, blood transfusion, needle sharing, and so forth. Now, the clinical manifestations of malaria, there's usually a one to four week incubation, but remember with falciparum, the most, uh, I think the most important malaria to remember the uh, incubation period is shorter, uh, 12 to 14 days on the average. But remember, with, for the strains of malaria, for the species of malaria with the hypnozoite stage, that can even be delayed for years. Um, and remember, those are uh, vivax and ovale. And as I said before, with the erythrocytic stage, the onset of symptoms usually coincides with red blood cell lysis and the release of the merozoites. Um, and uh, initially, this rupture is irregular, but as time goes on, it becomes more regular, and you get that classic tertian or quartan cord pattern with your, uh, with your RBC rupture. So um, uh, tertian malaria, vivax, ovale, and falciparum every third day or 48 hours. I may have said that incorrectly before. I, I apologize. It's every 48 hours. Plasmodium malariae, 
quartan malaria every fourth day or 72 hours. But sometimes you'll see periodicity uh, shortened to, uh, to 24 hours or so. So uh, this is uh, a slide, I think, from the Mandel Atlas, where you can see falciparum here being on the average every tw between 24 and 48 hours, Vivax more every 48 hours to 72 hours, and malaria, remember that's the Corton malaria, um, roughly every 72 hours or so. Now, if you're going to have malaria, you're going to have fever. That's the most common side effect. Fever and chills, um, but uh, headache, muscle pain, and pal palpable liver are also common side effects. Palpable spleen, not as common as you might think, only about a quarter of cases. Nausea and vomiting, uh, less than a quarter, abdominal pain, diarrhea, relatively infrequent. So the, the main symptoms you're going to be looking for are fever, chills, and headache, which are not universal to just malaria obviously but remember you need to take a history and determine if they could have malaria. Malaria is one of the most uh, significant febrile diseases in returning travelers and that's the important link. Um, so remember malaria as one of the most common diseases in returning travelers. So focusing now on Plasmodium falciparum this is the most severe and prevalent form of malaria and it is the form, this, the species of malaria where you can progress from asymptomatic infection to death in as little as 48 hours. So um, the, diag the suspicion of falciparum malaria should prompt treatment because if you're wrong and it, you're wrong about it being malaria and you think it's something else, uh, you may start therapy uh, at a time where it's too late. So. What's distinct about Plasmodium falciparum is it infects RBCs at all stages, whereas some of the other malaria strains only infect certain stages of uh, the RBC maturation cycle. The greatest mortality is associated with parasitemia, 5% or greater, and uh, nowadays there's widespread chloroquine resistance among falciparum malaria, so we can't use chloroquine a lot of the time for P. falciparum. So this is a patient with falciparum malaria. Have we had any, uh, for our senior fellows, have we had any malaria cases that you've managed in the last year? So. I know there was one. Uh-huh. And that was here at Tampa General, right? And it was a falciparum, I understand? A frequent traveler. Yeah. Where... Where, where we typically see, and this, this is a board, like a virtual board question, but, but it, in our population where we typically see uh, malaria is in missionaries returning from Africa. So I, I saw a case myself in the mid-1990s uh, when I was a fellow. And so if you hear about a patient with a f febrile illness returning from Africa who's a missionary, um, because remember, they're going to they're gonna tend to be in more rural areas. They're going to stay for a more prolonged period of time and they, they don't have uh, the benefit of native immunity um, that uh, uh, maybe uh, individuals originally from that area may have uh, who return to the area. So this is a, a case of, serious case of falciparum malaria or black water fever as it's known and you see this gentleman on, with respiratory failure intubated uh, in an ICU bed um, uh, critically ill with a lot of uh, complications, renal failure, perhaps cerebral involvement, um, and, and so forth. Now speaking of cerebral malaria, uh, this is a grave manifestation of falciparum, manifested by impaired consciousness, seizures, and coma. And remember that uh, uh, photomicrograph I showed of the uh, gametocytes basically clogging up the cerebral vasculature, and, and, and it'll give you a picture of what falciparum can do. Um, but it, as it turns out, it's more common in children and uh, universally fatal if untreated. And uh, unfortunately, in the patients who do recover, their prognosis uh, is, is not all that great. They can have long-term sequelae. And you, you particularly uh, tend to see this in cases where the, the parasite burden is high. So here we have an a individual who died of cerebral malaria. And you can see all these small punctate hemorrhages. 
uh, related to obstruction of the microvasculature with uh, parasitic forms. And uh, this is a devastating complication of uh, particularly falciparum that affects kids more than adults. Now, an important distinction between uh, how to manage cases of malaria is whether a case of malaria is complicated or whether it's uncomplicated. Complicated malaria requires um, aggressive, in, in many cases, ICU management, whereas uncomplicated malaria is a disease that can really be treated in the outpatient setting. In resource impaired areas in the third world um, that don't have as much access to the intensive care unit, some of these complicated cases even get treated at home. So um, it's not surprising if you have a patient with uh, a, a more milder form of malaria, even if they're having fevers and bone shaking chills, uh, that they can receive treatment in the outpatient setting. And uh, the response to appropriate treatment of malaria is, uh, is, is very rapid and it's, it's very remarkable. So these patients are treated and they, it seems like they recover within a couple of hours. Um, so complicated malaria tends to be associated with falciparum. The parasite burden is more than 5%. Um, these patients uh, typically uh, experience hypoglycemia that's uh, very significant, severe anemia. They may have pulmonary edema or ARDS usually oliguric, renal failure, volume issues, prolonged hypothermia, um, if there's high output vomiting or diarrhea, and pregnant women in particular um, have a very a great susceptibility to malaria, and, um, and malaria can be quite severe in uh, the expectant mother because of the relative immunocompromised state of pregnancy. Now what about uh, um, Plasmodium, vi Plasmodium vivax in a valley. Remember, vi of these two, vivax is the much is much more prevalent, um, but the clinical features are similar for both, and they tend to be milder because they both affect reticulocytes only. So they don't tend to have as high parasite levels, um, but you can still get anemia, thrombocytopenia, and splenic rupture. And remember that these two are associated with the hypnozoite stage, so there's a risk for late relapses in mosquito-transmitted infections. Malaria is, tends to be among the mildest, and it has very low parasitemia because it only affects mature erythrocytes. Um, acute illness is uncommon. There's no uh, dormant hypnozoite stage, so you don't need to treat, treat them with primaquin. And glomerulonephritis can sometimes occur. Now, how do you diagnose malaria? I spoke about this before. Again, the gold standard is light microscopy with multiple thick and thin smears. Um, as much as every uh, six hours, maybe even every four to six hours for 48 hours. We use the thick, mirror, thick smear rather um, for sort of a gross overview to, to look for the malaria parasite to see if it's present, sort of to make that diagnosis and then you use the thin smear to determine morphology. So how do you make a thick and thin smear? You make a, uh, a thick smear by, um, by putting a couple drops of the patient's blood on a slide and basically allowing it to dry. You make a thin smear by taking two slides, you put a couple drops of the patient's blood on slide A, and then you take slide B and you kind of rake it against, rake it across the slide to leave a very thin layer. And that's all there is to making a thick and thin smear for malaria. Yeah, and you'd want to wear gloves too. This, this picture was probably taken before the era of universal precautions. Yeah, so be advised uh, to be careful out there. So here's a thick smear, and you can see you're, you're basically looking for the, for the trophozoites and the thin smear here, um, if you're an astute clinician and or can pull out your textbook, you may uh, be able to conclude that these uh, trophozoites are consistent with falciparum and make a diagnosis right then and there without having to rely on PCR or other advanced testing. Now, fortunately, nowadays, we have the, what are called these uh, malaria RDTs or rapid diagnostic tests. 
And uh, these are antigen detection kits, usually a, a dipstick test. And uh, they can usually di differentiate between the two most prevalent forms of malaria, um, falciparum and, uh, and vivax. Um, they do have some shortcomings. They're not as reliable with species identification. They don't rule out malaria. So if you have a negative dipstick test and you still suspect malaria, you know, you want to do your thick and thin smears. And uh, false positives may also occur. And they can't calculate parasite density. So you can say that someone has a, a positive RDT, but you can't say that they have 5% parasitemia or 1% to 2%. So the blood smear still is very important. So here in the US, we have uh, one RDT available, and we have it available at the VA, and I assume we have it available here at Tampa General. Has anyone ordered an RDT here at Tampa General, malaria, malaria dipstick test, malaria antigen? So it's the Binax Now test, and as you can see, it, it uh, differentiates between uh, falciparum and vivax, and uh, usually um, uh, two, to two to six steps takes about five to 30 minutes. It's, it's also relatively inexpensive. So it's a, good, it's a good addendum to your, you know, it's a good way to screen someone for malaria. But remember, it's not a perfect test. It doesn't rule out malaria. And you still need to do your, your thick and thin smears. The, sens the, the sensitivity is, is, is pretty good. The specificity is also good. But it's not 100%. Yes, it only differentiates between falciparum and vivax. Um, but remember, the, together, those are more than 90% of cases of malaria. So, um, so it, it, it's very helpful that way. As I said, malaria in pregnancy, uh, the prevalence of malaria in endemic countries has increased during pregnancy. Immunosuppression, elevated cortisol levels, increased risk. Um, so these patients can have a much more severe course. Uh, these are some safe options for treatment of, of uh, the expectant mother. <coughs> you want to avoid the tetracyclines, uh, primaquin and halofantrine. Uh, of course, we need primaquin for the, um, the hypnozoite stage for vivax and ovale. So that kind of puts you in a pickle about what to do with these patients. Typically, I guess if they're late stage in their pregnancy, you want to treat them for acute malaria, and then you want to give them the primaquin after they, after they deliver. So... Um, uh, but, yeah. <laughs> so that brings up the, the issue of, uh, of what to do with nursing, expect, you know, nursing mothers who have had their, their, their child and, uh, uh, again, there are certain uh, anti-malarias, pardon the misspelling there, uh, that we want to avoid during nursing. Now, um, you know, I, I, as, as far as the issue of climate change, I, 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 you know, I find in the last couple years, uh, it seems like things are getting hotter and hotter, but there's a little more apathy among the public about this subject. Maybe they've been climate changed out, but, but, but I will assert to you that uh, climate change as a phenomenon will affect uh, the, the tropical zones of the world and, and undoubtedly will influence disease vectors. And um, particularly in the area of, of arthropod-associated diseases, uh, as I've said in the past, and I have another lecture where I address this more completely, but um, it's, not, it's not the, uh, the altitude um, in, a, in a tropical area that determines uh, the malaria endemic areas, it's really the temperature. So if you have warming, let's say, in, in the uh, tropical areas of the world, particularly South America, where you have uh, increased temperatures along the mountain zones, even at very high uh, air altitude areas, you can still have malaria. And that's what was seen in, in Bolivia uh, a couple of years ago when they reported um, a case of malaria at, at, on, uh, in one of their high mountains. Um, at 14,000 feet where it had never occurred before because of, of the warming effect and the, the fact that, uh, that uh, temperatures, mean temperatures were higher even at higher altitudes. The downside of that is that uh, there are many cities in uh, South America, for example, that are at altitudes that have t traditionally protected them 
from developing malaria. And as mean temperatures uh, continue to increase, uh, it may bring the malaria parasite to, uh, to um, affect many millions more people who, are at the, who live in those high altitude cities that, where malaria has never occurred before. Um, so we've seen that um, in, in several areas of the world. So we may see more malaria in the future uh, as the earth warms. Now, uh, moving on here, there's an interesting association uh, with malaria and host genetics. So um, humankind, uh, particularly humans in endemic areas, have developed genetic differences that protect them from malaria, and, and, and it's quite interesting. For example, uh, individuals um, who lack the Duffy blood group factor are more protected for Plasmodium vivax. And it's been asserted that sickle cell trait is really protective against falciparum and other species. And it's one of the, because of the crenation of the RBCs, it, it makes it more difficult to acquire falciparum malaria. And so it's a protective mechanism. That's why you tend to see that in uh, individuals f of African descent. Alpha thalassemia um, may increase vivax, but decrease susceptibility to falciparum. Therefore, you're susceptible to a less severe form of malaria. And in Southeast Asia, hereditary elliptocytosis uh, will make it more difficult for the ovalocytes to be infected. So uh, host genetics plays a role. Okay, so let's, um, let's talk about some general treatment points about uh, malaria. Remember that if you suspect a patient is having falciparum, it's an, it's an emergent situation and you wanna uh, Im admit them and start treatment um, until you see a response. Oral therapy is okay for these patients unless it's complicated as I defined earlier. And complicated, also known as severe malaria, requires ICU management. Now what are some tr trends regarding the treatment of malaria? Well recently, uh, in the last five or ten years, we've seen increased resistance to the older drugs. Unfortunately, we see that in some parts of uh, Southeast Asia in particular, uh, where monotherapy with, with certain malaria drugs was long adopted, and, and that led to increased resistance. So in particular, chloroquine resistance, very high, and sul sulfadoxine pyrimethamine or fanzadar resistance is uh, d uh, definitely increasing and is quite problematic. As a result, combination therapy is now recommended for malaria. But fortunately, we have some new drugs, um, including in, in the US, which are very helpful. Uh, particularly, I'll, I'll touch upon artemisinin-based combination therapy, or ACT. So um, uh, chloroquine-resistant P. falciparum is uh, common in most malarious areas. It's one of the reasons why you, you cannot use chloroquine in a lot of parts of the world. And it's related to this P. falciparum chloroquine uh, resistance uh, transporter gene. Fanzadar pyrimethamine sulfadoxazine resistance is highest in Southeast Asia versus, let's say, East and Central Africa, and are due to uh, polymorphisms in the dihydrofolate reductase and the, uh, uh, I think it's dihypophysine synthase genes. What about some other therapies? Uh, these are all um, have their pros and cons. In particular, mefloquine has long been used both in uh, malaria prophylaxis and treatment, but it's uh, difficult to tolerate. It has a lot of CNS side effects, and I, I would say is in uh, somewhat of disfavor. It, advantages are it has a really long half-life, so the dosing schedule is reduced. Malarone is a, uh, uh, a, a very effective treatment there's some question about increasing resistance. Uh, it's very expensive, and, uh, but it is an option, particularly in the US. Halofantrine has significant cardiotoxicity. Um, it's, it's a drug that's uh, fallen into disfavor. Doxycycline is very popular for prophylaxis, particularly among uh, US service personnel, because it also provides some protection against other diseases in addition to malaria. Uh, quinine carries with it its own uh, inherent issues, including uh, uh, the incidence of, uh, of, of cinchinism. Now, how about the artemisinins? Uh, these are the newest and the greatest of the uh, malaria drugs. Um, and uh, uh, 
they started out as a ancient herbal re remedy in China, uh, known as um, King Chow, I think. Uh, and uh, the active ingredient was purified in. Okay, no one's no one's gonna step up and and, and show me their their diversity here. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'm. I guess I'm as l more likely to pronounce it as anyone else. So, that's what I understand it's called. So, um, the active ingredient was purified in 1972, uh, Qingxiao Su, and there were Chinese. There were Chinese uh, trials in the late 1970s. Uh, remember what I said earlier about uh, the Vietnam War and the initiative uh, to develop this drug in the late 1960s. Uh, it, it ultimately resulted in artemisinins, which were extensively used in China in the 1980s and other Asian countries in the 90s. So there are four artemisinins, uh, artemisinin, artemether, artesanate, and uh, dihydroartemisinin. And of these, artesanate is the only one that's available IV. Now, they're all equally effective, but uh, since artesanate can be used IV, it has certain advantages in that respect. These drugs are very rapidly acting. They're among the most rapid acting of the malarial drugs. Um, and they're, they're also active against the gametocyte form of the parasite, where other therapies are not. They're well tolerated with very little toxicity. Um, there is some emerging resistance described, uh, prolonged parasite clearance in Thailand, Cambodia, for example. And it's one of the reasons why combination therapy is recommended. They're expensive, but uh, um, their attempts underway to improve their cost effectiveness. They have a short half-life, so usually you give them in combination with a second drug that has a longer half-life, and that's to preserve resistance and to prolong the anti-malarial effect. Um, a, a, typically, a malaria blood smear on day three of therapy predicts whether there's artemisinin and resistance, and they're now standard therapy in most countries. So um, what are the uh, the World Health Organization recommendations for combination artemisinin therapies, or ACTs. I'm going to cross out these two, again, because mefloquine, uh, again, is, uh, is difficult to take, has some tolerability issues, and Fanzadar resistance is increasing. A newer agent is uh, dihydroartemisinin and piperaquine, which is gaining popularity. Uh, if you don't have a our artemisinin-based combination treatment, amiodoquin and, and fanzadar is available. But again, we, we have to be concerned about fanzadar resistance. Um, so really, the, the two most popular therapies are uh, artemether lumefantrine, which is known as coartem. This is the formulation that's available in the U.S., and artesanate and amiodoquin. So this was a th uh, study from The Lancet in 2004. And you can see recrudescence and new infections, so the taller the graph, uh, the the worse or the shorter the graph the better so you see here chloroquine and fanzadar a lot of resistance increased uh, recurrent infection amiodoquine and fanzadar um, a little bit better but the the best performing therapy was the ACT the art artemisinin combination therapy so uh, best across Africa is usually co coartem or uh, dihydroartemisinin and piperaquine uh, the, this combination, artesanate and mefloquin, has some continued efficacy across uh, Southeast Asia, but there's uh, obviously some concern about mefloquin for several reasons. Um, avoid uh, these combinations, artesanate and fanzadar and artesanate and, uh, um, and chloroquine. These are drugs you can use in, in pregnancy. I think I touched upon that earlier. I'll move on in the interest of time. Now, I bring up this slide just to mention that uh, the development of newer malarials, anti-malarials, are, are very important because there's even some thought that now that artemisinin-based combinations are being used, that uh, resistance could develop there. And those are our best tools. It's kind of like in the bacterial world if, um, you know, we had to rely on carbapenems and, and then we saw carbapenem resistance occurring and we didn't know what to do. Actually, that's happening now, so that's a bad example, but you get the idea. So the spiroindolones um, are a new compound class for the treatment of malaria. And just to kind of give you a, uh, an introduction to 
uh, newer anti-malarial drugs. These act by rapid suppression of protein synthesis in the malaria parasite. The candidate drug is NITD609. Um, it has uh, the, the, uh, the potential for once daily dosing and uh, already, there's already a resistance mechanism described. So these drugs may come to a pharmacy near you for treatment of malaria. Now what's, what's available in the U.S. of A? You're going to be taking care of patients in, uh, in, in our country for the next couple years. And uh, so what's available here? Uh, well, for non-falciparum malaria, you can still use chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. And uh, if they have Vivax or Valle, you can add Primaquine for the uh, hypnozoite stage. But remember, before you give a patient pri uh, Primaquine, you want to do a G6PD screen. And uh, if they're G6PD positive, then, then uh, you, know, you, have, you have some issues to kind of go over. How about for falciparum malaria? If it's uncomplicated malaria, falciparum malaria, you can use coartum. And by the way, I would encourage that because it's a very well-tolerated therapy. Uh, quinine and doxy is uh, an option as well for adults. In, in peds, you want to think about quinine plus clindamycin. Uh, malarone is still an effective and well-tolerated therapy, although um, there is some potential for resistance. And mefloquine can still be used for uncomplicated falciparum, but again, it's not the preferred therapy anymore. For d severe disease, it's typically been a selection between IV quinidine and IV artesanate, but since cardiologists stop using uh, quinidine, it's really hard to find. So really the recommendation is if you have somebody with se severe falciparum malaria, complicated malaria, uh, you obtain IV artesanate. Now IV artesanate is not universally available. I'll tell you how to obtain it in just a minute. So you can go on the... Uh, the uh, IDSA or CDC website and print these guidelines for the treatment of malaria in the United States that summarize all this very well. Here's a, uh, a um, flow chart for the treatment of malaria also available at the URL that I've listed there on the CDC website. I'm skipping in the interest of time. Now how about uh, IV artesanate? Well it's been shown to be superior to quinine in multiple studies, but you can only get it through the CDC through an investigational protocol. So uh, you want to call the CDC malaria hotline if you have a patient with falciparum, complicated malaria, and the drug will be released to you from CDC quarantine stations. CDC quarantine stations were, um, were established in the post 9-11 era as a way to quarantine people with uh, contagious infections, but also as a sort of a shipping point or a drop point for, um, for medications for the treatment of biologicals and, and uh, uh, you know, other, other medications which um, need to be distributed, are controlled but need to be distributed by the government. And if you look, here we are in Tampa, Florida. There are uh, quarantine stations in Atlanta and Miami. Probably Miami would be our closest bet. So we're in, in relatively good shape as opposed to somebody in uh, in Butte, Montana or, or in uh, Wyoming who may have to rely on San Francisco or Minneapolis here. So, um, you know, quarantine state, you, we're lucky to have those quarantine stations so close. Well, I mean, hopefully the drug can be shipped to you promptly. Um, so, you know, if you have, if you have quinidine and the drug's not going to be available for 24 hours, it would be a good idea to start it. Um, but if, uh, you know, if you were uh, right down the street from the quarantine station, let's say we were practicing in Miami and uh, we could get the drug right away, then that would be available. But I would probably just volunteer Elias to drive down to Miami and pick it up and bring it back. So if that happens, Elias, you're on. So artemisinin resistance, um, uh, again, has been described. And so, um, you know, particularly in uh, Cambodia, Western Cambodia, North, North, Northwest Thailand, there's been uh, failures of mefloquine and artesanate, and um, amiodoquine resistance are already common. Lumefantrine has no known resistance, but, 
but uh, again, there's some uh, resistance issues there. And, and you don't want to use piperaquin with monotherapy. All these drugs, combination therapy helps. So Bill Gates and the Mil Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been instrumental in developing therapies and, preve and prevention and control of malaria in, in the third world. Um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has a 35 billion U.S. endowment. I think that's gotten bigger since Warren Buffett kind of joined the uh, foundation. Uh, malaria control is kind of a three-pronged approach. Vector control, control of the mosquito, the formation of vaccines, and more effective drugs. Now, what's the malaria risk in returning travelers? It's actually highest in Oceania, 1 to 30, more so than Sub-Saharan Africa. South and Central America are at the bottom of the list. Um, again, this is the most common specific etiologic diagnosis in returning travelers, highest in returning travelers from Sub-Saharan Africa, then that from Asia or the Americas, falciparum is most common. Chemoprophylaxis is an integral part of prevention. So if I'm going to go to a country that potentially has malaria, as you all probably do, I go on the CDC website, Information for Travelers, and they have um, regions of the world broken down by section, as well as uh, discussing what the malaria risk is and where, you should, when, where and when you should be prophylaxed. These are uh, prophylaxis drugs in travelers. Again, you can take chloroquine if you're going to a chloroquine non-resistant area. Um, mefloquine is a consideration, but I personally wouldn't take it. Um, Malarone, a good, a good effective therapy. Um, Tefenoquin is a, a relative to primaquin that's under development that is uh, dosed once a day and has some advantages. Um, prevention techniques, again, remember those mosquito nets. Just because you're in an air-conditioned building uh, doesn't mean that you can't be exposed to, mal to mosquitoes. All of us know that. And mal malaria chemoprophylaxis is appropriate where you're traveling to a certain area. Here are the malaria nets. Um, I think the Gates Foundation has tried to assist with getting more of these available to people in the third world. Mosquito repellents are listed here. I like the picaridin-based preparations. They don't, you don't smell like you're working at the gas station. And they have, um, they have a reasonable length of, uh, of, um, of efficacy of a few hours. But a lot of these have to be reapplied. And some of the preparations combine a certain percentage of DEET that's more tolerable with picaridin. Uh, there's a new one called IR3535, and uh, the oil of lemon eucalyptus um, for, for, for you naturopaths out there. Now, the malaria vaccine initiatives are a crucial part of, of a future of, of the world free of malaria. And uh, this is uh, from the uh, Malaria Vaccine Initiative website look, showing you um, which malaria vaccines are, are candidates for development and which are the farthest developed along. And uh, when we talk about malaria vaccines uh, and the, the approach to malaria vaccines, you have your pre-erythrocytic vaccines, your blood stage vaccines, and your transmission blocking vaccines. So the most developed candidate is known as uh, RTS, RTS um, slash five. I think that's a five, and uh, by GlaxoSmithKline, and this is now actually in phase three. So it's very exciting that there's an active phase three clinical trial of a malaria vaccine, which could be available by 2013. Can you believe that a malaria vaccine by 2013 that actually is quite effective? It's it, it's amazing. So uh, this is developed uh, uh, via Gates Foundation grant. It's a recombinant protein combining a P. falciparum circumsporozoite protein fused with hepatitis B surface antigen. How about that? And it induces T cell and humoral immunity. It's being, it's in a phase three trial in seven African countries. And a vaccine trial in 2009 showed long-term protection against malaria for up to 45 months. So it's expected it's gonna be submitted to regular, regulatory bodies as early as 2012 and it could be available for young children 5 to 17 months as early as 2013. And remember that kids have the greatest morbidity for malaria because they, because, um, they tend to be, um, have greater complications at that age. And protection of, of, of uh, infants and, and young kids 
at, at that age could be crucial to uh, breaking the strain of malaria. So in summary, and I'm sorry I've gone over a little bit, uh, it's a major cause of morbidity and mortality in the developing world. The most severe strain, of course, is falciparum. Therapy is, uh, is progressing um, in the area of combination therapies because of the emergence of resistance in parts of the world where monotherapy was, was used. We need newer drugs. Maybe the spiroindolones will be one such example. And maybe by the end of some of, some of your, the junior fellows here, maybe by the end of your fellowship, we'll even have a malaria vaccine for the third world. That's exciting to think about, isn't it? All right, any questions?